Listen to conversations with some of today's most innovative brands to hear practical advice and insight on technology, customer experience, co-creation, marketing, entrepreneurship, and more. Welcome to the Brand Lab series from AE Marketing Group. This week, Brian has an exclusive conversation at the Skyline Club with five C-level executives about B2B marketing, technology, fintech, innovation, edtech, and Bitcoin. Our guests include John Everts, Chief Operating Officer at Mediafly, David Van Himbergen, Chief Executive Officer of Tidespin, Mike Wolf, Chief Executive Officer of Zorch, Abby Ross, Chief Partnership Officer of Think Circa, and Nick Economos, Chief Retirement Officer at Fiduciary Financial Partners. We hope you enjoy the conversation. So, John, I know Mediafly has had another really great year. Congrats four times on the Inc. 5000 list, also named a best place to work by Inc. Magazine. The B2B tech space, especially in the area of sales enablement, is just growing so fast. So what kind of excites you about the year ahead, both for the industry as well as Mediafly? Yeah, sure. So so thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I, I think... The opportunities that we've seen in the last couple of years, I think, is just kind of going to kind of ex- accelerate. Our focus really is with the large enterprises, and um, rather than you know, kind of, I'll say, the prior ten years, they really focused on bottom line growth. Um, so EBITDA focus and and, uh, and return uh, return of shareholder value. Um, now what we're seeing is a is a shift in the large enterprise, and, and we're seeing a lot more focus on innovation, a lot more investment in revenue generating activities. So it's a good great time to be aligned with the sales and marketing teams within those organizations. Um, and so as they focus on things like sales execution, which is really the space that we play in, sales enablement, sales execution, helping sales teams uh, wherever they may be, whether it's the direct sales teams or it's uh, the distributors or it's the partners or alliances, um, we are able to make sure that the sales uh, folks really do um, uh, deliver a, an excellent experience in the field. Um, so it's both educational, it's an interactive experience, and it makes sure that people look forward to the next sales interaction because it's actually valuable, right? So that you're not avoiding the salesperson. Um, and so we're really excited uh, that as people kind of think about sales enablement and a broad definition of sales enablement, not just the direct sellers, but also those partners and those distributors, um, you know, we see more opportunity for expansion um, and kind of growth as, as we look ahead. Uh, from a risk perspective, um, as we go into 2018, uh, I think GDPR, especially for some of the folks that we deal with, um, they're really kind of focused on this global data protection regulation um, that's on the on the horizon, especially if you're operating in the European Union. Um, and so compliance with that, I think, is uh, the other piece that we're starting to see is a little bit of concern um, around uh, when May 25th approaches, kind of what, what that's going to look like. Well, it's interesting that you also talked about um, enterprise-wide companies, but also innovation, which I think is an interesting lead into David, because you know David came from. I remember when you were on the show and you said it's, you've been 17 years at Procter and Gamble, and I can't think of like a bigger household name brand than some of the ones in, in that portfolio family. But yeah. your charge there was innovation, which has kind of led to the spin out of of Tide Spin, no pun intended with that. But as you think about the larger organizations that are trying to innovate, like some of the startup companies around this table, like what's some advice you'd have for? Lo- trying to really tackle innovation mindset uh, in 2018. Yeah, um, I, I think I, I agree with the point of there's probably less focus on EBITDA and more focus on top line growth. Um, I feel like that's certainly coming on our end as well of like we have very robust, strong market shares, leadership in most of the categories that are remaining in our portfolio. So now it's like, okay, how do we unleash that and grow faster? And I think a lot of that is just powered through speed and agility so one of the things that i talk a lot about with our senior management is it's it's no longer the big eating the small it's the fast eating the slow and we're one of the slow guys <laughs> so we have to figure out you know how how do we enable ourselves to build capabilities that we can be faster and uh, more agile in the marketplace and a lot of that times that's just how do you use, use technology like machines are always going to be faster than people um you can you know data becomes the capital of the future that's really valuable and so how do you start to acquire more data and use that to then power back to the systems um, so I think it's kind of um, thinking about how you build capability 
um, that leverages technology to enable you to be fast and agile because it, it does feel like that the winners in any given marketplace are those that can be fast and more responsive to the, the customers and markets they're serving. I think the other thing that we, the trap that we've historically fallen into is that we get very infatuated with solutions and then try to retrofit those back into a business model or solving a problem. And so what we've really tried to enforce some discipline is like, get very uh, deep into understanding what that problem is and how you're gonna solve for it. And also validate that like, there are a lot of problems that exist and there's certainly an infinite number of solutions that could come to market, but finding a problem that's significant enough, frequent enough or others that someone's willing to pay to resolve it, like that's kind of the starting point for any business model. And so make sure you kind of start there first. Well, one of the things we talked about when you were on the show, which I love about Tidespin, is the fact that this whole on-demand service is to provide your customers the ability to have a precious commodity, which is time. Yeah. Uh, when you think about how much the on-demand economy is kind of surging, is there something that you're really hoping for that doesn't exist yet, or is there something that you could see maybe really taking off in the next year? Yeah, um, you know, I think because we've been at this for about a year and a half, our emphasis was that we wanted to start really simple. Um, make sure that you can kind of uh, establish that there's some traction with the business model, but keep it as simple as possible to kind of validate that first. And then only, it's the same way with like agile development, like only add in features once the you know that it can add value back for the customer. Otherwise, you're going to be over investing in features and whatnot. So. For us, you know, we're just using laundry detergent and products that are off the shelf at a Target. So we've got uh, 40 SKUs on the shelf there. There's one that we could use, right? That it's gonna be good enough. But um, some of the opportunities that this starts to unleash is, you know, we've got 825 scientists that work for Fabric Care across the globe for Procter & Gamble. And they've got a lot of um, technology and things that they've never been able to bring to the retail market because there are other constraints of, I've got to put product that can sit in a bottle for up to six months and not like cross contaminate itself or like affect the, um, the efficacy of it. So now that we've got this system that's more controlled and more of a service side things, we can start to unleash some of those technologies that we didn't really have a home for in the past. So what I'm hopeful and what we're going to start to um, introduce over the next year, like we should be able to do a far better job with your laundry than what you can do today um, because there are just fewer constraints within that. Um, so that really then sets us up for the future and even what we've you know, eventually sold our leadership to, which was a bit of a leap of faith, but are you willing to give up that your core business is not the best performing uh, part of your portfolio, um, that you kind of be open to cannibalizing that in some ways and moving, yeah? So it um, feels like there's a lot of opportunity. It's cool stuff. I mean, innovation is 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 a, is, a, is a great topic or subject matter to study in itself. But yeah. and then getting down to the to the to the brand or the customer level, like what is, what are they going to pay for? What what solutions yeah. do they want you to help with? You know, those types of issues. It's also awesome. Flies in the face of your core business. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And that's um, you know the leadership support has been such that like, look, if we sit around very complacently, like someone's gonna disrupt us. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't we rather it come from the inside? Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the chart, not only of our team, but then this broader group that they've created around us that's kind of looking at other opportunities and business models. So. Well, what I love about Tide Spin in particular, though, is also um, is someone who started a company, like some of us around the table, is you had the luxury, at least, of an iconic 75-year-old brand to kind of like <laughs> bolt on the front of that. Sorry. Uh, no, no. You're saying it was easy for him? No. <laughs> I, I don't think it was easy, but uh, I think having tied uh, and, and uh, that kind of mindset behind you and that awareness yeah. behind you goes yeah. a far way of saying, Hey, I'm with AE Marketing Group. Who? What? Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, is it A and E? Is it AE? What is it? Um, but you know, speaking of like global brands, I think what's interesting about you, Mike and Zorch, is so you've disrupted the whole branded merchandise industry using technology. Uh, you're, you know, you see that in the fact that you're growing at five times the industry average. You have some really big global brands there. And I can speak for everyone on my team, when we come to your office, it's like a kid going into a store because you have some of the coolest products we've seen. 
<laughs> and people are always filling up their bags, whether or not you know it or not, uh, before we leave. But uh, so, yeah. So as you think about uh, the branded merchandise category today, like what are some of the hot products that people uh, that people seem to be gravitating towards today, and uh, what's kind of the the outlook on the industry in the year ahead? Yeah, I mean, you you, uh, you kind of think what what could be the next possible hot tchotchke, right? I mean, it's been industry's been around for a million years, so what could be the new things? And you know, I think a lot of it just evolves at kind of two levels. One with an, at an industry level, for example, things that are green, sustainable. You know, those are really starting to take more and more. Uh, you know, get more and more interest from our clients, um, but also in an environment where they're willing to pay more for them. You know, it's kind of the, um, well, we'd love a collection of everything that's made in the USA. Great, it'll cost three times than a normal collection. Well, maybe not, you know, and same thing with green products. And uh, we were seeing a, a, a higher degree of interest and in willing to pay for that going forward. Um, you know, from, a, from an overall, from product perspective, you're seeing innovation there, but then also, I think if we're looking at industry tre trends, it kind of trends with the GDP for the most part, um, and I think we got a nice tailwind going right now. And you know, I've you know I've been working for 25 years, only five in this industry, and very rarely do you get the opportunity to actually say, "Hey, I think we got a tailwind economically," but we do, and um, we're seeing that a lot of our uh, marketing contacts that are actually getting more to spend. You know, and and it, you know, you think about if you're running a business and you can, there's a variety of things you can cut. Uh, you know, again, branded merchandise, unfortunately, is going to be near the top of that list, right? Because you need to pay people, you've got to work on an investment in your own company. Typically, we would be one of the first ones that they would go after to cut, and we're seeing those budgets actually expand, which is great. So um, I think that's a, you know, a good uh, indication for the overall industry, at least going into 2018, provided, you know, nothing bad happens. So. Well, uh, as we were talking about before we rolled, about some of us around the table are parents uh, and have kids in a varying uh, range. Some of us are even empty nesters. But uh, Abby, one of the things that we talked about in your episode, which I think is great, is how much Think Circa is changing the way kids are learning today. And just within the last couple of years, if you had told somebody I work in ed tech, they probably would have been like, I don't know what that is. And now you're seeing this entire industry um, coming online that is really changing and making some necessary changes in the way people learn. What I'm curious about is how is ed tech actually being um, received by teachers in the classroom and how are kids embracing it? I know you guys are all around the country. Uh, so what does that look like in the year ahead? Yeah, um, it's been kind of like a wild ride over the past five years from when we started. Uh, I always tell the story that 28 of our out of our first 30 customers bought technology so they could use our product. Whereas now our sales team is calling people and they are, you know, calling into schools and districts that have made the investment into infrastructure, whether that's, you know, bandwidth or and broadband or uh, the actual devices. Chromebooks are super affordable and really have been deployed at the level of kind of one-to-one. -one. Every student has their own device, um, which has been, you know, we've been talking about technology and education for the past 20 years, but now it's, it's finally happened. They've made the investment because they realize the importance of technology and digital literacy in 21st century skills. Um, and so what's what's interesting kind of from, from our perspective is, you know, you talk to some people and they're like, oh, textbooks will be replaced by digital. Um, but you also have to remember that people go to school for a reason to have that kind of social emotional learning to get knowledge from a teacher and from peers and you can't just hand a kid an iPad and an app and expect them to kind of come out college and career ready and ready for the workforce. So really kind of where innovation sits with, with our business and really kind of like the wave of ed tech is figuring out the human behavior design in schools so that teachers don't feel like they're being replaced with by technology, but that they can now become the facilitator of learning for their students, which is what every teacher wants, is they want for students to be engaged and you know collaborate with each other and that for them to kind of be met at their own level of readiness. So how can we empower teachers and empower students to um, essentially reach all the levels of learners? So if I'm a seventh grade teacher and I have students reading at the third grade level, seventh grade level, and then 10th grade level in a classroom, one lesson is not gonna fit all of their needs. So how can we use technology for what technology is best for, which is personalizing some experience, 
but still allow that teacher instead of kind of like we call it sage on a stage where you're just kind of lecturing to, to students for you know hour at a time one lesson and one lesson only how can we use the technology but mobilize the teacher so he or she's working in small groups mm -hmm. with students um, facilitating discussions and in, in that kind of project-based learning collaborative environment so that sometimes they're on technology but the moments where they're not on technology there's there's an enhanced learning experience so that trans transformation of teaching um, you know, I'd say we've, we've invested in the infrastructure and we've got the, the goods in the classrooms. Now, the pace at which that innovation is happening at the individual classroom level, you have three million teachers. So the scale is happening very differently across the country. And so we want to be the thing that kind of pushes people into that, into that space of innovation and, and causes the change and the shift in instructional practice so that a teacher is, is kind of changing um, their lesson plans, but but never losing that connection with, with, with students, so. Well, and I know you love being uh, a fly on the wall in the back of classrooms around the country, so, you know, it's been five years, you described it as a wild ride, but uh, it's got to be incredibly a proud moment where, when you're in the back of a classroom, of a Think Circa classroom, like, talk about what that experience is like. Yeah, well, you know, we were in about 250 districts across the country, and what's what's great about it is that it that means that there's 250 different implementations. It's not a one size fits all. It's meant to be flexible, but um, kind of the the fixins are always there in different classrooms. You're always going to see a couple different scenes. One is you will see students like looking up at the ceiling with their hands on a keyboard thinking really hard and you can like see kind of their brain on fire a little bit um, and then you'll also have really noisy classrooms so I love walking into classrooms where it looks like just absolute chaos but students are having discussions and debates about the fourth amendment about um, the future of farming and technology and innovation we have like a social entrepreneurship unit where they're talking about how to build a business and constructing knowledge together so it's awesome to see kind of the what it looks like and then to know that um, you know based on third-party studies it's not just a kind of what's happening in the classroom but that this is causing impact for for students and growing their reading and writing ability so to look at kind of our data and see here are students writing at the beginning of the year and here's their writing at the end of the year and to sit across from a superintendent who has tried to do this for 20 years and now has the proof is incredible. Yeah. As you're describing how technology is enhancing the classroom, I'm thinking of Mediafy and how technology is not replacing sales and marketing people, it's just making them more relevant in that given moment, which kind of really creates a lot of win-win experiences for everyone. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I, was, I was actually thinking the same thing. So a lot of kind of, his, I'll say, historic uh, industries, right? And you know, education <laughs> is a historic industry. Yeah. They're all getting disrupted right now, right? Whether it's merchandise or whether it's CPG. Mm -hmm. A lot of our, our customers are in CPG. Mm -hmm. And so you have these brand new generation who requires technology, 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 but you can't forget about everybody else that is working right now and that may not have the opportunity for understanding and being educated on the new technologies that are out there. And so the way that we think about it is the user experience Experience has to be so simple and so strong and so good that you're educating and that you're entertaining at the same time with the experience in the field, right? And so whether it's for us, that's uh, like, uh, for instance, Chicago-based companies like Canagra or, uh, or Miller Coors, right? Where we're working with those teams to make sure that the adoption of all the, the folks that have been there for 30 years um, have a very, very strong experience in the field. Um, so I was thinking about the tenured, the tenured teachers that are like, okay, whoa, you know, <laughs> now I have all this technology and all these tools. Like, how the heck am I going to do that? Uh, clearly, you have to have a great experience. You have to have the great opportunities to uh, to relate to all the material in such an intuitive way that it doesn't change their understanding of the material, but it enhances their ability to deliver the material. Right. Well, you know, the other thing that's funny uh, since Nick, the time you were on our show, uh, with the whole rise of, of technology hitting every industry, it's even hitting the type of currency we talk about today. <laughs> yeah. and, and I know a big thing uh, that you you do is you help organizations on the employee side of the brand, like making sure that uh, those companies are providing good benefits, uh, both short-term, long-term, balancing needs of younger generation workforces with older generation workforces as well. I know you talked a lot about how people are working more now than, than they ever did before. Uh, but what's so interesting in, in about a year since you were on our show is like 
every day you hear something about Bitcoin or something in the area of cyber technology mm -hmm. uh, and or cyber currency, I should say. Uh, talk about that. As someone who has spent a career in financial planning, is is, is that something that, uh, where do you think that's going to go? And I know that I'm asking you to look into a crystal ball. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I certainly don't have uh, the ability to predict the future, right? And uh, certainly crypto is like, it's everywhere. You can't avoid it. Um, to bid or not to bid, I guess, is the question, right? And, uh, and certainly when you see prices rise like they have, I think that that uh, creates a lot of sensationalism and a lot of attention, right? So. Um, you know, really unlike, you know, regular money, uh, uh, you know, metal money, metal, metal based money or paper based money, it's, it's, um, it's computer based money. It's, and it's, it's a digital wallet. So that's, that's really what it is, is a form of a currency that, that currency isn't really backed by any form of government. Uh, it's not regulated certainly or anything like that. So, um, you know, understanding what it is, I think is important and how do you get it? It's basically either exchange some fiat currency, some dollar or whatever your currency du jour is, and you, you purchase it or you participate in the mining of it. That's that's kind of how it works. So but I think the way to like think about it, you know, I think it, you know, it's you know, is it gonna go to three hundred thousand or, you know, all this this fluff, I think the real context that people are missing is um, you have really like three major asset classes, right? You have stocks, you have bonds, and you have cash or currencies. Um, and uh, stocks, really, what you're doing is you're when you purchase a stock, you're you're purchasing the right to the future earnings of that company, the future profits of that company, right? And so I can value that, right? I can I can maybe um, anticipate what those earnings may be either by looking at history or some type of formal valuation or something like that. But uh, uh, so there's there's that piece of it. Bonds. Um, you know, it's kind of the same thing. I, I have a future cash flow that includes the return of my principal. I'm gonna get interest payments and then the return of my principal at some point. So I can kind of value that. Um, crypto, you know, or any currency for the matter, a dollar, like just because I have a dollar doesn't mean I'm gonna have more dollars in the future um, or it's gonna be worth more. And, uh, and so really what it becomes is um, what does somebody wanna pay for that or how does it compare to other currencies? It's really kind of purely speculation and uh, um, you know it's hard to to value that so that that's kind of the what you have I think the context you have to look at the lens you need um, is understanding that and you know crypto you know Bitcoin is, is a popular one there's a lot of them I, I kind of joke about um, you know something about Mary when he's like oh I got this thing seven minute abs and then, <laughs> then somebody you know he's like oh, what about six minute abs you know so uh, um, there's a lot of currencies no, out there yeah six, six minute, minute yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> which is, is similar, you know? So that's, that's kind of what I see out there. Uh, uh, you know, I think just, you know, caution. I mean, if you look at it at the price of like $16,000 of Bitcoin, um, you know, all of the Bitcoin in circulation, which I think is about 16 million, give or take, um, would have the value of like one-tenth of 1% 1 of the global stocks. So it's pretty small in the in the frame set of overall investing. It's a small piece to the pie, you know. So uh, you certainly won't want to run in guns a blazing typically, uh, and uh, just be careful and really understand what it is and what you're trying to accomplish and how it aligns with your goals. So that's that's why that's my take on crypto. Well, it's interesting though. I think about what David talked about, and speed is everything. And I think someday there will be whether it's truly Bitcoin or something different. I think there will be some form, but what that looks like yet, I think is kind of to be determined. Beyond the currency issue, talk a little bit about how technology is really changing the financial services industry. FinTech is as big as ed tech and, and many other technology isms today. I just think like, from my perspective, like we don't make a technology product, we, we utilize technology and the tech is, the innovation in, in fintech has just been unbelievable, right? <laughs> and uh, and people now, um, I think you know, human capital is people are trying to unlock. You're you're talking about unlocking like intellectual property in a sense, mm -hmm. right? I think people are really going to be focused. The smart companies of the future are going to be focused on their human capital and how they're managing that human capital. And I think um, from our perspective, the technology is available. I think employers are having a hard time understanding how to integrate some of the technologies that are out there to help them um, um, 
manage their human capital more effectively, and it, it translates down to the bottom line, a lot of it, right? As our aging workforce increases uh, or moves through their life cycle, um, you know, there's certain things you need to be aware of as a, as a, as a, as a, as a financial officer of a company. Um, there's also uh, um, the human side of it, you know, the, the basic HR side of it, you know, getting the right people, attracting them, helping them to, you know, stay. And, I, and the trends that we're seeing are, in our industry is the convergence of um, the technology with a lot of the problems. Student loans are a big problem. Um, certainly creating financial independence is a big problem. We talked about some examples on your show, but uh, um, you know, I think that um, how, do we, how do we change behaviors is another one that we're gonna see through the technology. But how do I leverage all that technology to create financial wellness? is something I think that is a struggle for, for employers. You're gonna see student loans, healthcare, retirement, all of that start to consolidate at the workplace and, uh, and people are looking to kind of like make it easy for me to deal with these issues um, so I can focus on in maybe innovating, right? Or creating a better sales experience or you know, whatever it may be. So that, that's, that's kind of what, what I see from, from our seat in the, in the in the mix of things. So. I, think, I think to that point, I think um, those companies that can figure that out, so one of the things that we're thinking about right now is uh, there's a Chicago-based company based out of 1871 called Peanut Butter, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's what they focus on, right? They talk about uh, taking care of student debt uh, mm-hmm. and, and helping to pay down rather than focusing on 401k, right. they're focusing on you know, retiring student debt. Yeah. Um, so I'm always fascinated by that side, right? When there is innovation, there is an opportunity for employers uh, to do something right by the employee um, and optimize what you call your benefit mix, Mm -hmm. right? Where you have, you know, you have your comp, right? You have your title, you have then like 401k, is yep. that is that the right mix anymore? Right, long term disability. Sometimes that's the right mix. Sometimes it's not. Right. Do you offer more or less PTO? Right. But as you think about the entire matrix of what you're going to be offering somebody, mm-hmm. and you think about these new products that are coming out and technology allowing that to happen, yeah. I, I'm fascinated by kind of adding that to the mix. When do you do that? How do you do that? Yeah, and it's and which pieces, right? How yeah, exactly? There's a lot of different technologies out there, and how do we deliver so that? We can take care of the human capital, invest, reinvest in it, get rid of their stresses, right? If, if there's a lot of evidence out there that says, that, you know, if their mind is elsewhere, right, they're not giving you their best. So how do we how do we kind of use the technologies that are available? And some of it's going to be some old school rules that were written years ago that are going to come back into play because now we have the technology to make, you know, consolidating and managing a lot of that stuff um, make it easy. Right? And that's that's the key thing. And if you can make it easy, you have such an amazing advantage, right? A competitive advantage. Sure. Right? Because your onboarding and your retention capabilities of keeping, especially in the in the environment, it's only I mean, so as the economy improves, um, you're gonna everybody's gonna need to hire. Mm-hmm. And if everybody it's, needs to hire, it's gonna get more competitive. How how do you yeah. how do you differentiate in yeah. your in your experience to say, hey, we're the right employer for you? Yeah. Yeah, and it starts I think with an examination of what are your values, right, as a company and as it relates to your employees. And then I think it's some of that like co-creation of like, okay, well, how do we innovate with, um, you know, our objectives as a company and our values? How do we how do we how do we interweave that with the demands of our, our people or the needs of our people? So it's it's pretty fascinating. I mean, it's really really cool the amount of data that we're we're being able to extract from those systems and how they're all starting to connect and talk to each other and the and the the implications are are pretty 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 important. I think um, so. Well, I know you, you two in particular have heard me talk about co-creation for years and years and years, but I actually was smiling when uh, Dennis Boker, Global Innovation Head at Bosch, and Howard Tolman were saying that you can no longer avoid co-creation, that any individual and any company will not have all the solutions. So it's how do you find the right partner companies? How do you find the right people? How do you bring the right people in to kind of solve some of these new market realities? Uh, and on the technology side, what's also interesting that you talked about is I look at marketing, obviously. I, I know we all touch marketing in one way or another around the table, but the core principles of marketing haven't really changed. It's just how do you harness what technology now allows you to do uh, and, and how do you integrate that in the way that you redistribute the channels of marketing. Uh, so, that, uh, so it is really interesting that obviously the, the underlying theme of all this today, I think, is technology, innovation, uh, creating good experiences, whether it be for your employees or for your customers, uh, in terms of creating some some brand success. Uh, so I think with that said, uh, it's been a great conversation. I super appreciate you guys uh, 
giving uh, more of your time uh, is kind of great guest on prior episodes of the Brand Lab series. Uh, I'm thankful for you guys to be with us at the Skyline Club today and uh, look forward and wish all you and all your companies great success in the year ahead. Thank you. I want to thank our listeners for joining us in the Brand Lab today and to invite you back next Tuesday as we continue our journey of today's most innovative brands as we learn how they empower employees, engage consumers, design products, and co-create experiences together. Until next time. To hear other episodes of the Brand Lab series, visit brandlabseries.com or visit iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, or Stitcher. Follow us on Twitter at at Brand Lab Series. And if you have any questions or would like to participate in a future Brand Lab, email us at info at aemarketinggroup.com.